catching up to it. It's great to have large arbor reels on any fishing situation, certainly here when they go way out in the back and you've got to try to catch up to them. Oh, that's a nice fish. That's a beautiful rainbow. Ate the chronomid. Just those, just tells you that it's just good to show that nice sized fish, big fish will eat small food items. Simply because, again, there's so many of these pupa in the water column. And it's an easy meal. Get the net ready. There we go. Okay, so got the fish here and we'll just uh, give you a quick look at them. It's a well-conditioned rainbow. I'll just let her go. It's a beautiful fish. So fishing chronic patterns catch fish like that, you know they're good to you know it's a great pattern to use. Well again, uh, good color combinations, good looking fly. Okay, we're we're going now to a midge pattern. You call this the red green, like uh, named after the uh, famous Canadian television show? <laughs> This is, a, this is a chronomid larva, or what we often refer to as bloodworms, but chronomid larvae come in two common colors, maroonish red and then shades of green, usually um, a medium light to light olive green. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are chronomid species or midge species out there that the, that the larval stage is two-tone, candy cane uh, green and red, mm -hmm. and this pattern is a good representation of that. Almost a Christmas larva. Well, like a Christmas tree. Well, I have a Christmas tree pupa too, but we thought we'd show the larva today. Okay, that sounds good. Well, let's take it away with the red green midge larva. Sounds good. Chronomids or midges have a complete life cycle egg, larva, pupa, and adult, I'm going to tie the larval stage of a midge or a chronomid. The fly I'm tying now I call the green and red midge larva. So it's actually a larva that has both, it's, it's bicolored red and green, and it can be quite common, uh, particularly in western still waters, and they can get quite large. The hook I have in the vise today is, is a curved nymph hook, a 10 3x, so it has a slight bend in the shank. And that's just to give a little up. Uh, you never see a straight larvae in the water. They're always wiggling, so they always have some shape to them. I've got a 1 8 inch silver lined glass bead, which I've, I've slid up to the eye of the hook. And then I'm going to be tying in a dot uh, red uh, pre-waxed tying thread. And I'm just going to form a base. The flash of blue is going to be the underbody. We can have a couple strands of that. And then uh, it's going to be ribbed with uh, Stillwater Solutions uh, Midge Stretch Floss in the bright red color. And then there'll be a secondary rib of fine silver wire. The first step is we're going to uh, just lay a foundation of the red, or pardon me, the silver wire down. Should be the final rib and then the first rib will be the the red the bright red stretch floss and again I'm gonna tie that in behind the bead I'm just using the material to build the body up a bit so I have our two ribs I'm gonna take a few strands of of the lime green flashaboo and I find it's sometimes uh, with, fla with uh, using, using flashaboo to wet it a bit to, to calm it down and get it to lay down on the, on the hook a little easier. So again, I'm going to lay this down right behind, tied in right behind the, uh, the bead as well. And bring my tying thread back to the bend of the hook and then forward again. And then we'll take our our flasher boot, and we're going to just 
build the underbody. So midge larvae live at the bottom of the lake. They live in little tubes in the bottom area and they feed on detritus or decaying, decomposing vegetation that passes by. Most, most midge larvae or most midges in general have a one-year life cycle, but there are some species particularly, and it's usually the larger species like this fly is imitating, can live uh, for up to two years in the larval stage before they're gonna emerge as, as the pupa and then finally as the adult. So it's not uncommon in extremely productive still waters to see midge larvae that are in excess of three quarters of an inch in length, so they can get quite large. And that's what this fly is imitating. So I'm just going to take my red um, stretch, mid stretch floss, and uh, give it a rib. Five to seven wraps would be good. Bring that up to the bead. Tie that off. And you notice I've got some tension on this rib, so you've got to make sure you counterwind it to lock it in from behind and then in front. Because as soon as I release the tension, she's going to want to come back. And then the last step will be to take our fine silver wire and just lay down this rib uh, in front of the ribs that we just laid down of the mid-stretch floss. Now we're going to be fishing these, these flies close to the bottom because that's where they, they live in those tubes at the bottom. And um, so a couple ways to fish this would be with full floating lines and varying lengths of leader so that we can get the leader long enough so the fly will sink to the bottom of the lake. And then we can slowly retrieve it or inch it in just above the lake bottom. So typically the majority of chronomid larvae in lakes are living in 25 feet of water or less. So that's why we can use that full floating line. The second way to fish this is under a strike indicator and just suspending it uh, six inches, four inches off the lake bottom. And an excellent situation would be to have a slight ripple on the water, quartering a cast out to the side and letting the indicator end fly just drift downwind, just up and down, undulating just over the lake bottom. And when you're, when you're wind drifting any flies under a strike indicator, whether they're midge larvae, midge pupae, leeches, baby damselfly nymphs, things like that, you wanna be using a loop knot, a small loop knot, either a Duncan loop or a, like a 97% loop knot so that that loop allows that fly to pivot that much more realistically. So that's a, a great little tip to really increase the chance of catching a fish. So I'm just going to use the whip finisher now and finish the fly off, like so. So there you have the completed um, midge larvae. Um, it's, it's bright because it's got the two colors in it, but it's a good color combination that when you look closely in many lakes, you'll see that color. What I love about fly tying is some of the names that are given. I just took a very quick look and I always saw I was pregnant. And <laughs> I'm gonna let you pronounce this one since you're a biologist and uh, tell us what this is all about. This has obviously gotta be a uh, scud of some type. That's right, it's, it, this fly pattern jack is called the pregnant gamma shrimp or scud. Um, so shrimp mate numerous times a year. Uh, the females with eggs, they, they hold the, a, a cluster of eggs under the underside of their thorax. Trout are not colorblind, and we all know trout can get quite specific in their feeding patterns. And it's very common for trout to feed only on pregnant female shrimp. And we know this by doing throat samples or through lots of years doing stomach samples when I was at work, you would do a diet analysis of a fish and every uh, shrimp in, in the gut of the fish was a pregnant female. So we tie specific patterns to imitate that orangey reddish brood patch of eggs. 
Sounds like they practice population control. The, they, the, the trout do the thinning. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a look at the scud pattern. I, I don't think you can have too many scud patterns. Uh, they're a, a fly that's really, as you know from, the, from being in the States, that we literally love. And there's about every color on earth well, that a scud can have. Exactly. And you know, scuds or shrimp, they are truly the bread and butter food source of our productive still waters. Without them, well, put it they this way. They wouldn't put on weight, would they? That's right. Every good productive still water has a good foundation or population of scuds. Or freshwater shrimp. There you go. People know. Right. Let's take it away with this innovative pattern. Shrimp or scuds are a real staple food source of trout in productive still waters. There's basically two very common species of scuds we'll see in our lakes. Hyalella, which are very small, reach about an eighth of an inch in length. And then their larger cousins called the gamma shrimp. They can reach almost five eighths and even three quarters of an inch in length when they're fully extended and swimming through the water. I'm gonna show you how to tie a pregnant gamma shrimp pattern. Now, the reason why you want to get that specific tying a pregnant female with eggs is because trout are not colorblind and they'll actually select just the gamers females with an egg sac, a bright orange egg sac of eggs, and they'll just select them out of, out of the maze of millions or trillions of, of scuds that are swimming around in the water. And we know this by doing throat pumps or if you did a stomach analysis of a fish, uh, you would see oftentimes three or four hundred scuds in the stomach of a fish and they're all just females with an egg sac and so that's why we're tying this fly. The hook I'm using today is, is a curved uh, shrimp pupa hook. So it's got the nice curved back to give a bit of an arc to the back of the shrimp. I'm using a dot olive tying thread. The material for this fly will be Stillwater Solutions Soft Blend in Dark Olive. And the, I'll be using some fine uh, bright orange dubbing for the egg sac. And then as we tie it later, the shell back of this fly will be Stillwater Solutions uh, Midge Flex, one inch, inch diameter wide in olive. And that will be the shell back. And we'll finish the, the fly off with uh, some silver wire fine silver wire, or pardon me, fine gold wire uh, for the ribbing. So to start to fly off, I've tied my tying thread in and I'm just forming a, a tying base down the hook. I'm just gonna tie in my final rib of, of gold wire, tuck that aside. And then I'm gonna take my midge flex, which is stretchy, and we're gonna, that will be the shell back in the end. So I'm just gonna tie that down the shank of the hook as well. So that will be the side. And we're gonna take our soft blend dubbing now. And we're gonna put a little bit of dubbing wax on our tying thread, like so. So I'll just put some wax there. Our soft blend, and I'm just gonna form a little dubbing. And so the yeah, I'm putting on a I'm not putting on a lot of dubbing, I'm trying to keep it fairly thin because we can always add more as we tie the fly. And by putting smaller amounts on, we can uh, control the, uh, the shape of the fly a lot better. So I'm just going to take the dubbing now and bring it winder up. I'm going to go about two thirds of the way up the body of the fly to about there. And then I'm going to uh, Put a bit more wax on. So, 
and then I'm going to take some of this bright orange uh, diamond dub that's going to imitate the uh, a brood pouch, the egg sac or brood pouch. Eggs, dump that in there, like so. Get that in there, and then I'm just going to tie that in. But a fairly prominent, like so. I'm just going to get rid of that little tag in, and then I'm just going to slide a bit more of my olive soft blend up that to finish the fly off. Like so, and that'll that'll be good. Then I'm going to take the um, our shell back and pull her tight over back of the fly and under pressure by stretching it I'm just gonna tie it down like so and again wind on both sides of it so it's locked in otherwise it'll let go on you get that off and then I'm going to go back and get my fine gold wire and I'm going to add a rib to the fly. So, and tie that off. Maybe talk a little bit about now, when they're pregnant. Yep. Now, once I finish the fly, and tie it off, I'm going to have to uh, take a dubbing brush and I'm going to, or a needle, and I'm going to be picking out the legs of this fly. So I'm just going to now take a, a little botkin, like so a little needle, and this takes a, a little while, and you got to do it carefully. It's going to form. But what we're doing here is using it to pick the legs out. Shrimp are a great pattern to use in the spring and in the fall. Trout can eat them every day of the year if they want to because they're always there. Um, because they don't hatch necessarily at, at specific times of the year. They mate nine, ten times a year. But trout really like to eat them early in the spring, late in the fall, w when there's less other food sources available. So it's, we call it a bread and butter food source. And you always want to have some of these in your box. You don't often see f free, sw free swimming shrimp in a lake. That's because those ones get picked off by trout right away. Where they live and where they seek cover is, is in and amongst the benthic or emergent vegetation that, that grows off the shoal or the littoral zone of the lake. They swim in and out of that stuff, trying to keep undercover from, from any uh, cruising trout that might want to eat them. So that tells us that we want to fish shrimp patterns close to the bottom or close to some vegetations or some structure where they can seek hiding places. So we often use slow or intermediate sinking lines to fish shrimp patterns, or you could use a shrimp pattern, a floating line, and a long leader. And sometimes we'll put soft putty lead or non-toxic putty lead on, on our leader to help sink that fly a little quicker to get it down there. And, it, and we're going to be fishing four to six inch long, medium, slow uh, strip retrieve to bring the shrimp back uh, uh, to your boat. So now that I've, I've uh, teased out the legs, I'm just going to take my tying scissors and, and kind of, uh, I'm going to cut, trim, trim the legs so that none of the legs are are hanging any any longer or below the um, uh, the barb of the hook, and that way the fly is going to swim properly in the water. So there we have a a, a pregnant uh, gamma shrimp, and we'll just have a quick look at that finished fly. Shrimp, or better known as scuds, are one of the most common food sources of trout in still waters. They're a bread and butter food source. All productive lakes 
that support big populations or big fish, all of them have freshwater shrimp in them. They're a staple food source available year-round for trout to feed on. One of the best lines to fish shrimp is a clear, intermediate, or slow sinking line. We're going to cast out and we're going to wait. We have to wait or do a countdown so that we know our fly is close to the bottom of the lake. So, for instance, intermediate sinking lines sink at about 1.5 inches per second. We'll know the depth we're fishing because we're using a depth sounder. And we know, or if we're looking at a contra mat, so we're going to wait enough time for that fly to sink to the bottom. Once it's down within a foot of the bottom, we're going to start a continuous but steady hand twist retreat with two or three quick pulls. Scoops them up, see what they look like, see what the color they are, and see the size that they are because they'll vary in size and you want to match as closely what you have in your fly box as what's in the water. We know what I love about Canada is they're so liberal and they have their fly patterns are so crazy and I like the popsicle leech. I've caught a bunch of fish on it and I just noticed the Las Vegas leech. What stays, what is it, what's that term? What happens it's in, in Las, Las Vegas, Vegas stays in Las Vegas. <laughs> what happens in Canada stays in Canada. So we won't tell you about this leech. Right? <laughs> no. Las Vegas leech, it's obviously colorful. It, and that's why I called it that. It's, I don't normally tie a lot of attractor patterns uh, that are flashy, but uh, this particular uh, leech, uh, very flashy in color because of the use of uh, peacock uh, crystal chenille. Uh, it's, it, it's a good pattern that works early in the spring and late in the fall when the fish are aggressive, looking for food, and there's something big and gaudy going by them, um, it seems to work. Well, you know, I have a friend that calls a, a, his streamer the Las Vegas showgirl. There you go. I mean, you know, what, what can you it, say? I, I would assume it's pretty flashy, too. Yeah, it's pretty flashy, a saltwater fly. Yeah. You know, and you know, one of the things that I find so innovative about your uh, Stillwater Solutions is the use of brilliant colors and the combinations of mute colors with brilliant colors reflecting. I, my whole bench is full of, of Stillwater Solution dubbing and I, I really like what Superfly is doing here and I know a lot of fly tires in the U.S. are going to be uh, benefited by your use of blends. That's right and, and you know the whole idea was to try to get colors that, that Phil and I thought would represent the natural colors that we'd often see in invertebrates, aquatic invertebrates that trout fed on in still waters. You mix that with the right balance of some flash mm -hmm. material and you got something that's going to turn their heads. And you've also dyed the natural uh, feathers like partridge and, and uh, Tur uh, turkey. turkey and I mean there's all kinds yep. of them. And, and to match those blends. It's a good combination. Oh it's fabulous. Yeah. And so let, let's move on. I know that you're going to be talking about this, but I just thought we'd tell everybody about it. So let's go on and find out what uh, stays in Las Vegas or whatever that <laughs> term is. What happens in Las Vegas and Canada stay there. <laughs> The next fly I'm going to tie is called the Las Vegas Leech. So it's a flashy name and there's a reason for it. We're going to be using some pretty sparkly uh, crystal chenille to tie the fly. The beauty of this fly though and the reason why I tie it is that it's an excellent leech slash uh, attractor pattern that works well on early spring trout and particularly again on late season trout just before freeze up. Those two times of the year trout are very very aggressive. And the reason for that is that there's not a lot of insect hatches occurring early in the spring because the ice has just come off or the water isn't warm enough for those big midge hatches to start. And in the fall, the water is super cooled. All the insect hatches are basically done. And so the trout are looking for bread and butter food sources. And when you strip a, a flashy leech in front of them, you don't know what's going to happen. So a simple, another very simple fly to tie, but can be extremely effective. Uh, I'm going to be using I, from a 10 to a 6, three extra long shank streamer hook for the fly. I've got a 1 8 inch uh, gold metal bead uh, for the bead head, and that's going to make that fly swim up and down the water. So I'm going to be using uh, Stillwater Solutions Long Strung Marabou in black for the tail. Like this. I'm just going to uh, take off some strands 
peel off about a quarter of an inch off the stem and then pull it off. And we may have to take a couple chunks of it like that. First I'll bring my tying thread back to the bend of the hook. I'm going to lay this down and I'm going to 